started. And recording is on. All righty. Let's see. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We will get started in a second. This is the webinar supporting development of ocean acidification water quality thresholds in California. Just give us a minute. We're waiting for people to join. Thanks for joining us early, 8 a.m., nice and early in the morning. Give it another minute or so. Alrighty, we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us today who are attending the Supporting Development of Ocean Acidification Water Quality Thresholds in California. We are scheduled from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. And we might not take the whole time, but we will get started. All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Haley Carter. I'm a program scientist at the Ocean Science Trust in Oakland, California. I'll be hosting this webinar on behalf of the Ocean Acidification Science Task Force. This is the second webinar in the series. Um, this is, we'll be having Steve Weisberg join us. He's the task force co-chair. He's gonna be moderating the discussion today as well as kicking off the presentations and introducing our speakers. All right. The purpose of these webinars on behalf of the OAH Science Task Force is to track scientific efforts related to ocean acidification and hypoxia across the region. Also to provide a forum for engagement between scientists and decision makers, we do have Jonathan Bishop from the State Water Resources Control Board on today, as well as some scientists from Southern California Coastal Water Research Projects. And also this is a forum for technical discussion about ongoing and unpublished science. So this webinar is being recorded and will be archived at the West Coast Ocean Acidification Hypoxia Science Task Force website, listed here. To ask a question or provide comment, we're encouraging folks to use the chat box at any time during the presentations. We're going to be saving questions after all the presentations are complete, and we'll have initially a discussion with OAH Science Task Force members, and then we'll open it up to questions from the public. So yes, please use the chat function on the side panel and chat in your questions to us. So about the Ocean Acidification Hypoxia Science Task Force quickly, this body was convened earlier this year in response to recommendations of the West Coast Ocean Acidification Hypoxia Science Panel, who released their findings in 2016, and they were also convened on behalf of Assembly Bill 2139. The task force is co-chaired by Steve Weisberg of the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, and also Francis Chan of Oregon State University. And they are serving as a responsive advisory body to the California Ocean Protection Council to inform continued action in California and beyond. And as part of this, they are developing a science appendix that will support implementation of California's ocean acidification action plan, which is now out for public comment through next week. So our agenda today, we'll pass it off to Steve Weisberg after these opening remarks, and then we'll hear from Nina Bednarsik on synthesis of, ocean, of thresholds of ocean acidification effects on pelagic mollusks. Then we'll hear from Martha Satula, applying thresholds to support investigations of local pollution um, impact in the Southern California bites. And then lastly, we'll hear from Jonathan Bishop. He will present on process and challenges in translating the threshold knowledge into a regulatory framework. And then as I mentioned, we'll open it up to a discussion with the task force members and then a Q&A with the public. So please chat in your questions at any time. And next, I will pass it over to Steve Weisberg, Executive Director of SCORP, who will introduce our speakers and provide some opening remarks. So take it away, Steve. Thanks, Haley. Uh, starting point for today's uh, webinar uh, was uh, an a, a ocean acidification and hypoxia panel report that came out about two years ago. This is a panel that was put together across the uh, West Coast uh, uh, governors, uh, included 20 uh, scientists, and one of the things that they put into their recommendations was that we need water quality criteria. 
those of you from California will know that California at this point has a draft ocean acidification action plan uh, under consideration. Uh, it's out for public comment. And one of the things that's identified in that document is the need for water quality criteria. Uh, why has this come about? Well, in California, the, uh, the water quality criteria associated with acidification uh, was issued in 1969 and has not been updated since. Uh, what it says is that uh, water quality discharges should not increase pH by more than 0.2 pH units. Uh, this has several problems. First off, we are not even sure at this point whether pH is the best thing to be using for acidification criteria. Two, um, it is uh, a 0.2 increase uh, relative to background areas because really the, the criteria was written around the concept of um, a discharge, that a local discharge should not be so acidic that it should change the local water which isn't all that relevant to the kind of issues and thought processes and management considerations we have right now. And third, it's point to change, um, but it doesn't have a number. And as such, we, we don't really have a target. It's not a biologically driven target that managers can go after. So towards that end, uh, that's why you're seeing these recommendations that we need criteria. Beyond needing criteria, we also need really management goals. Um, so criteria is very much a regulatory thing, but there are things that happen even before the regulatory component. Um, so as a, for instance, the state is investing right now in how do we go about looking at things like phytoremediation, using kelp or using seagrasses to uh, ameliorate acidification effects. Um, and in order to judge whether or not that um, is effective, you need to know what's the target you're trying to get to. Um, we don't have those targets. So we're looking for management targets. The webinar today will kind of talk to you about the progression, the process for how we might get there. And it has three parts. Part number one is Nina Bernardzek, who many of you will know is a acidification scientist who's been working on essentially the biological thresholds that, that before organisms respond. She has a project that she's doing for the state to help them toward how do we take the data that's already been done by a lot of people and try and form that into a threshold that they can use for management purposes. The second speaker will be Martha Satula. Martha's involved with a project that's doing some modeling to look at how would acidification uh, conditions change if we were uh, to reduce uh, nutrient inputs to the ocean from anthropogenic inputs like agricultural runoff, wastewater treatment plant runoff, uh, and things like that. In order to do that, when you run the models, you need to know what's the target we're aiming for, what represents good conditions, what represents bad conditions, so you can assess change. Um, and so that's kind of one of those intermediate applications. And so we'll kind of see the interplay between the kind of things the scientist, that Nina does, and then the management applications um, of how that might be used. The third speaker will be one who would talk to us about the long game. Jonathan Bishop is the chief deputy director for the State Water Resources Control Board. When we talk about developing criteria, Jonathan is exa exactly the guy who will be developing the criteria. Um, and so what he'll be doing is talking to us about, okay, so this is where you're at from a science perspective. How do we now move from that science perspective? What's it going to take to move from that science perspective into a regulatory arena? And so with that, we'll uh, allocate uh, about 30 minutes for Nina, uh, about 15 minutes for Martha, and about 15 minutes for John. That will leave us an hour for questions. We will reserve the first 20 minutes of questions for the task force because this presentation is really oriented to ensuring that they have all the information so that they can provide recommendations to the state about how they move forward. But we will reserve also 40 minutes for uh, feedback, comments, and, and questions from a more general audience. So with that, uh, let's have Nina uh, bring up her screen uh, as our first presenter. And hopefully with the Zoom, you can see not only her screen, but you can also see the people like Nina who are presenting. All right. And at this point, Nina, you are presenting, but you are not in full screen mode. And now you're in full screen mode, but you're not on your first slide. I'm not. So you are. Oh, I am. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Nina, you're up. <laughs> 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. So, um, Steve mentioned that we have some challenges in using ocean plan for ocean acidification. So instead of going for um, chemical relevant endpoints, the whole idea is now starting to use and conceptually think about the biologically relevant endpoints. But we all know that this is a fairly complex process. So how should we even tackle this? So let's start from the beginning, really. Some of the key questions that we need to consider when we are talking about the acidification endpoints is really what sort of tax are we going to select and what habitat does these tax represent? The second question is really more uh, related to the temporal basis for the threshold. Management really needs the magnitude, the duration and the frequency exposure to be able to judge these endpoints. The third point is OA enough or do I have to deal with the multiple stressors? And probably the most important um, last question is really how do we start translating this information from the individual to the population level effect? Because we know we have to start being worried about the, the effects when they hit the population level. Okay. In regards to this last point, I just wanted to show you how we are conceptually thinking about these ranges of responses that we are describing as a declining biological condition on y-axis, which is intricately basically connected to the decreasing OA conditions on x-axis. So if we start on a top uh, right of the screen, we basically have no observed effect. So whatever we see is within the natural variability window. Um, but as the stress uh, is increasing, so when with the prolonged duration or the magnitude of OA conditions, first we start hitting the resistance threshold. So that's an initial point of decline. And if the stress continues, we're going to go through the set of sublethal responses until we come to the exhaustion threshold. That's a secondary inflection point of decline. And soon after that, the lethal response will follow. So really, we are trying to track this lethality because conceptually, this is a point where we can start translating individual type of effects into population level effects. So keep this conceptual uh, biological condition in mind as we are progressing through. Coming back to the which taxa and their representative to use, here at SCORP we have selected three different focal taxa um, to be basically going through this selection of different endpoints. The first one are pteropods, pelagic zoo, calcifying zooplankton representative of upper 500 meters of the uh, water column. The second are echinoderms, is a um, species or the, the taxa, the group, is representative of shallow to deep water habitats, pelagic and epibenthic, depending on their life stages. And echinoderms have a, a specifically important ecological role. And the third taxa, which also shares very um, same species features as the echinoderms, but it has commercial importance, are crustaceans. So these are three different uh, focal taxa and their representative habitats that we at Squirb will be going through the entire process of selecting the endpoints for. So again, why pteropods as taxa? As, as mentioned, they are pelagic indicators, but they are also satisfying all the other parameters in the decision criteria. So they have demonstrated sensitivity to ocean acidification, particularly through shell dissolution, but we also know that all the other uh, responses in pteropods are heavily impacted by ocean acidification. Another criteria that they satisfied is their widespread distribution through the entire U.S. West Coast and importance in the ecosystem. So food source for a variety of different fish, birds and whales. OK, so I'm starting at the end. This is our key graphics for pteropods, six different thresholds. Each threshold has a magnitude and duration related to it. And this, this uh, thresholds really are describing a response measures from the unimpacted to severely impacted response measure in pteropods when exposed to aragonite saturation state in the range of 1.5 to 0 0.9. So if this is our final graphics, the crucial question is then, how did we arrive at these graphics? So I want to take you on this journey of different steps, different approaches that we have basically uh, used in order to derive this because this is an immediate 
uh, tool that can be applicative for a variety of different management purposes. Okay, so we have been really using this four-step approach where one step is essential and complementing the very next step. So in doing so, we started with data collection and the literature review. Once we had that done, we proceed with meta-analysis. The really why we have used the meta-analysis was to try to simplify of the responses because we have identified obviously that there is a complexity of different responses uh, in, the, in the data. And we wanted to use the meta-analysis to either exclude or combine some of the responses. So really pure simplification of, of this step. In the next step, the third step was the breakpoint analysis. And it, in, in this step, we identified the particular thresholds. Once we have all this done, we had experts coming together and uh, trying to reach the expert consensus on this particular threshold and solidify this entire process uh, in, in getting towards the synthesis of the thresholds. So keep this four step approach in mind and I'm now gonna take you through each of the steps. Okay, it all starts obviously with the data collection and literature review. So we've compiled the global data set uh, basically to identify which sort of stress response measures are there in theropods that are responsive to OA and which of the OA parameters best describes stress response measures. Remember that we actually don't know which, um, which criteria or, um, or carbonate chemistry parameters we, we should be using, if that's pH, if that's aragonite saturation state. So that was like important parameter to identify that. It also, the third factor here was a compounding factor, how, for example, life history, different species across different uh, geographical gradients um, are potentially impacting the, the synthesis of the thresholds. Okay, so while doing the data synthesis in the review uh, stage, we have identified two important points. First, very good news that we actually have an abundance of data that would support our next steps towards derivation of theropods thresholds. So altogether, we had 18 different studies and approximately 3,000 data points, which actually included 22 different response measures. So really abundance of data that we could have this comprehensive view how theropods are impacted uh, um, by ocean stratification. Another very important thing that came out of this literature review was really figuring out that all of the experimental um, experiments that have been designed and conducted have used aragonite saturation state as the best measure for OA stress. And so it was fairly easy then to progress to the next stage with the experts while deciding which of the parameters to use confirmed that aragonite saturation state is the best measure of stress response to ocean acidification. And uh, another important thing was that whatever basically the literature was using and this experimental conditions, the range of that also represented the existing gradients in the California current system, making it easy to translate that between the experimental conditions and then in situ in, in the field conditions. Okay. So that's a good news. On the other hand, while we were basically going through this literature review, we also figure out that there are 22 different response measure. So that's actually a complexity of different responses. So we figure out that, for example, for, um, for one type of effect, for example, for the exposure effects, there are six different response measures to basically describe the same effect. And so you can only imagine that that brings the complexity because not only there are different units used, but they could describe slightly different processes as well, right? So our whole thing was then to try to reduce down the amount of these uh, response measures, obviously simplifying it. But the question is really, what do we exclude? What sort of measures we combined, right? At this stage, that's not obvious. So we decided we're gonna use the meta-analysis really because that's a very good tool that helped us simplify this complexity of responses that we recognize as a potential obstacles going further. Okay, just a brief background on what the meta-analysis is. It's really a statistical technique that summarizes the results of the primary studies, identifies the patterns, the traits, the trends along this large variable data set. 
we particularly use it for two different purposes. We evaluated the robustness and signal to noise ratio of this response measure. And that means we eliminated some of the response measures, especially the insignificant ones, but we also combined the others where, where we felt that that was the case. The second use of the meta-analysis was to evaluate the influence of confounding parameters, right? So life stage, duration of the exposure, which species, how important are these potentially confounding parameters to impact the responses? So should we combine them or consider them separately? So as you could see, a lot of different questions that the meta-analysis can really address. And so uh, let me take you back in how we have actually done this. For our meta-analysis, we have used raw data and we have separated it between the control and the effects group. Then we have transformed this data and we call it this common currency is called the effect size or LNRR. And we have uh, assigned a confidence intervals to that as well. Okay, so that was just how we have rearranged our data and, and the statistical analysis between these two different groups. But then we also need to know how we're going to interpret the meta-analysis results because the meta-analysis can really give us the estimation of significance of the response, the direction, and the magnitude of the response. And all these measures are really needed in order to get us then to the next stage. So significance is basically judged by where the response lies uh, in respective to uh, zero LN, LNRR line. If it's on the line, the response is insignificant. If it's left or right of the line, then it's negatively or positively um, significant, respectively. The second thing is direction of the response. If it's lying left, it's negatively impacted. If it's lying right of the this zero LNRR line, it's positively impacted by OA. And the third thing is the magnitude. For example, here we're showing how polar and west coast responses are substantially different in their magnitude of the response. So we have been looking at this as well while judging all these response measures. Okay. So now we know how to do it and how to interpret the results. And this is our meta-analysis of pteropods of various different responses that we have identified through the literature review. They come in these three major categories, exposure, physiology, and lethality. I will not go through the entire set of processes, but basically they are describing all the, the range of different processes. And now bearing in mind the biological gradient that exactly describes this transitioning into lethality as well. Okay, the main message is here. Almost all of the, of the response measures were negatively affected by ocean sphication. And when I'm saying OA, we really think aragonite saturation state. Right, that's really important. With the exception of two different processes, all of them were neg significantly negative affected. And the other two that was either insignificant of, or positive, we have then excluded this uh, response measure from um, the next steps. So that really tells you that it's not only shell dissolution that is negatively affected in pteropods, but a variety of different processes that are really connected, well connected. And that gives us the basis to continue the steps further because now we have this in, conceptual basis of how things are connected in pteropods. All right, uh, we are also trying with the meta-analysis to, to figure out which of the other parameters contributes the most to the variability of the responses. So the, the confounding effects of different parameters. We have identified two, the life history and the regional responses to be the most important ones. On this figure, you'll see the magnitude of the responses between the juveniles and the adults being significantly different, with adults being much less sensitive in comparison with the juveniles. That's the first one. And we have also identified regional differences to play a role, uh, but that was to a lesser extent. And we only combined the regional data set when that was justified. So we have taken it into account when it really mattered. When it didn't, we have combined these responses. Okay, so now we are ready to go to the next stage. That's a breakpoint analysis or a change point analysis that we have done. Before we look into how we have done that statistically, I just wanted to give you basically an understanding of what is a threshold, right? 
Okay, on the figure in the left, we're looking really at the ideal scenario, how to recognize these thresholds from our data. And here we'll see the discernible change in the magnitude under OA stress and this steep gradient from lower to higher OA stress, right? Uh, but that really is an ideal scenario. More often than not, we're looking at something depicted on a, on a right figure where this threshold is really not so easily discriminated from the data. And we need advanced statistical analysis to help us determine where that threshold is. A useful technique how to go about this is if we first identify the endpoint in biological response on y-axis, so think about something like where is the 50% mortality and how this corresponds to the acceptable level of stress, so OA stress on, on OA uh, um, x-axis. And so this would be then your threshold. So two different approaches. Now we're going into our data sets with that. And so when analyzing our data sets statistically, we were always looking for the, the value uh, that is called least observed effects or LOE. So this is the identified breakpoint before the significant change in data actually follows. So beyond that point, we'll either have significant decline or increase in the responses. And we have done that for the, a lot of the experimental studies. Okay, now we have come up with the sets of different LOEs. And whenever it was possible, we tried to couple this with the in situ responses as well. Because if we could validate experimentally derived LOEs with the field derived data, that reduces the uncertainty and also validated our experimental LOEs. So it makes it much easier to translate what we have gotten in experimental conditions as LOE, so this threshold, to what would be a representative threshold in situ. And in the last steps now, we've gathered the expert consensus, and that was the final ingredient in all this synthesis, and a really important one because it solidified this process of consensus seeking. So we had seven different therapeutic experts coming across, across the globe to Squirp. We had a workshop for the three days, and part of their job really included uh, the review of the thresholds and meta-analysis, voting on which particular response measure would be the most important, but also the rating of these thresholds. In that way, each individual expert had their opinion how we should rate these thresholds. So we basically had a confidence interval now related to these thresholds. So this entire process now solidified this consensus. When talking about the confidence scale that we have applied to this threshold, we were using the IPCC confidence scale approach that basically uses evidence, so type, amount, quality, and consistency of, it, of evidence, combined it with the agreement to actually get to this confidence scale, low or, or high confidence scale, depending on how this evidence and agreement mesh. So we were basically using the same approach, and this is what we have come up with. All right, so the figure on the left you have seen already are six different thresholds that are describing dissolution, calcification, growth, egg development, and survival process of magnitudes and duration. But now we also have uncertainty related to that. So this is very important step because if we don't have that, it's gonna be much, much more difficult uh, to decide which of these thresholds to actually use. So in this way, we actually had uncertainty that had a, a full range of uh, confidence score, ranging from very high for the solution processes to very low for two other processes for egg development and survival. So I think this is really now a, a crucial point in trying to provide these thresholds to the management community in judging which of these um, endpoints would be the most useful for the management. Okay, so we have now conceptually wrapped up this process of deriving the thresholds. So the very next thing is, what should we do with that? Okay, one way of how to apply these thresholds uh, to model outputs and why to do it is basically try to visual the, the, visualize the potential habitat at risk. 
Here we are having one model output during the upwelling, upwelling season and basically plotting a variety of these uh, different um, thresholds to describe different habitats here along the U.S. West Coast in particular for the for the bite region in here and we see that the mild dissolution is predicted to occur in more offshore waters and as we are going more in the coastal conditions the severity of a conditions OA conditions are actually um, marginalized marginalizing the survival and uh, we have this uh, thresholds of survival being representative of there so in the coastal region survival might be uh, most impacted in there okay so this is the theropod story. It's completed. We're waiting now to submit the manuscript. And as we are doing that, we are now doing the very similar things for the echinoderms and the crustaceans. We've basically uh, now done the, uh, the literature review and also meta-analysis for the echinoderms for which we have currently identified 40 different studies, 13,000 data points, and also for the crustaceans, currently having 19 plus studies and 10,000 data points and still running on this analysis. So we're in the process of doing similar stuff for these two uh, focal taxa. We're planning a next workshop for the echinoderms in fall 2018 and for the crustaceans in then in spring uh, 2019. So stay tuned. All right, but I just wanna give you a, a, a teaser on how these echinoderms uh, preliminary data look like. It's actually very similar in uh, identifying the parameters that might impact uh, these groups. Similar as for theropods, life stage is really important, as well as different taxa. So taxa representative of different habitats might have potentially different responses to OA as well. And another, another thing that we have identified was the fact that while we were able to uh, basically align all the theropod response measure to aragonite saturation state, we now see that with echinoderms, uh, pH will be uh, more suitable parameters, and we're thinking that we're going to have all the response measures um, described uh, with the pH rather than aragonite saturation state. So this is the first type of differences, and I think it's going to be really important how we decide which uh, parameter then to use for different uh, focal taxa. All right. Okay, so this was pretty straightforward and simple. We know how to get to these univariate thresholds uh, with this straightforward consensus-based process. But in reality, oceans are never as straightforward. The ocean conditions are always much more complicated than that. We know that OA very often co-varies with dissolved oxygen, so low oxygen concentrations in the years where we had higher temperature, OA and temperature might be actually co-vary as well. So we are now moving from conceptually thinking uh, uh, from additive to more non-linear biological responses that might follow due to these multiple stressor scenarios. So how do we account for this multiple stressors effect on habitats? Here I'm just showing a very simple uh, preliminary conceptual diagram, really how to think about that. And if we start with um, the star of the threshold on the left side of the univariate threshold, we can position it somewhere on this uh, saturation state um, gradient. And as the stressor hits, this threshold is gonna move towards the right and it's gonna have a different value now under the two stressor scenarios, right? So we are moving from different thresholds if we are thinking of deploying several, so multiple stressor scenario. So this is a very important thing. And obviously what we have identified is that we need tools to assist with the interpretation of these thresholds under multiple stressor scenario. It's not anymore a one point, it's gonna be a line of points that will describe these processes. So what we have done as an identified solution for this fairly complex process is using habitat suitability index models. These are just a bit of a background. These are statistical models that can define the relationship between the environmental gradients and species abundance or even just presence absence. And they're very good because they're not only empirically based, but they could have a mechanistic understanding ingrained in them as well. And um, 
Another thing, their benefit is that they are good to describe the non-linear, so interactive stressors. Um, so no longer just one stressor, but in, basically we can start using multiple stressors in these uh, uh, predictive scenarios in order to describe the habitat suitability. And that's all what we need to link it then for, with the biological data for. So we have so far done this for cheropods, and I want to show you our results and how well we think this approach might work. So developing cheropod uh, habitat suitability model is really um, trying to use two different models. One is mechanistic model and the other one is empirical model. For the mechanistic model development, we have used our experimental data from multiple stressor experiments that we have been running. And for the empirical data, where you, empirical model, we're using field data. So these are the time series of pteropods along the US West Coast on abundance and corresponding environmental parameters that we have now for almost uh, in, a decade of the data that NOAA uh, West Coast Ocean Certification cruises were collecting uh, since 2011 onwards. And this actually represents one of the, the largest spatial database. So we are taking the benefit out of that in developing this. Okay, so first let's think about this mechanistic model and how we use our experimental results to directly apply it to HSI. So these are the results on a figure of, uh, of our experiments conducted under high temperature and low ocean acidification, so OA stress. And we use these experiments to provide the evidence of this uh, combined stress together. And you'll see under just one single stressor, uh, we, were, we were seeing the partial survival. So, so survival was an uh, uh, endpoint that we were basically measuring as a response of stress. But under the two combined stressors, we have seen complete mortality. And that really gave us to think that these two parameters are probably the most important ones in guiding in situ mortality as well. So we have basically constructed the relationship of the mortality and use that as our mechanistic model. These are our results, which is basically a conceptual representation of habitat compression from these two interactive stressors. So how this works is basically we're plotting the pteropod presence and absence in this temperature on X and the ragonite saturation state on Y axis space, right? And what we see in here, and, so, and the red line is basically a 50% mortality. The line is derived from the experimental data. What we see in here that observed presence absence data of pteropods in this temperature OA space closely follow this 50% mortality line. So we have the presence uh, above the 50% mortality line. As, and um, the color bar actually represents the HSI index with warm water, with warm colors being low HSI index, uh, so unsuitable conditions, and the cold colors being high HSI, good conditions. If we are employing now another stressor, this HSI index changes. So imagine that we have warming and acidification working together. Now we're gonna push these uh, conditions into more warm, so yellow, um, yellow area of the HSI, where we are gonna see much higher mortality and unsuitable HSI index corresponding with the pteropod absence. So now conceptually, we have actually made a big shift because we are transitioning from one threshold and the univariate stressor to a mortality line that is indicative of a pteropod's presence, absence under multiple stressor conditions. Just wanna let you know that this, act, this approach actually works really well and our developed HSI model successfully predicts pteropod's distribution and we have found high habitat suitability index in the north, as you could see high HSI values, corresponding with high abundance of terabots in there, and low habitat suitability index in the south, corresponding basically with the absence of terabots in that region. So we think we're in a very good position where we can now start predicting the population level effect based on this suitable habitat, and it's basically an excellent tool that we're gonna to use for the other um, focal taxa as well.
Okay, so this is just another application of HSI in a high, in much higher resolution model here in the bite region, also identifying the regions of most or the best habitat suitability indicated in red and the least suitability indicated in blue. And we see we have this highly variable and dynamic conditions in here, but we can actually can start describing this these uh, habitats on a much, much smaller basis. So use of HSI in any type of modeling or monitoring data um, can be actually uh, quite well uh, applicable. All right, I'm almost at the end, so I just wanted to um, guide you through the take home messages um, that we have so far produced. So we have come up with the key graphics of the synthesized thresholds for theropods that was produced through the four step process with experts to get the consensus on this. We're currently working on echinoderms and crustaceans and that work is advancing rapidly. And we've seen some of the applications of the thresholds uh, for the monitoring and model output and we're continu continuously working with that as well. On the other hand, we are recognizing the importance of the multiple stressor and start developing the tools such as HSI statistical models to consider really how to put this multiple stressor impact into available habitats uh, because we're going to use these models to visualize the habitat compression and this is the tool that's going to help us transition from the individual to population level effects. So numerous applications going on. Marta will take you through some of this and this is um, on my part so far. Thank you. Thank you very much Nina. Um, so uh, we are as Haley mentioned, we're going to hold questions until you heard all three of the presentations. Martha, could you pull up your slides, please? Um, in introducing Martha, um, really it builds right off of what Nina just said. It's not just a matter of how do we develop the science of thresholds, but how do we then transition them into applications? And there are two types of applications that we have been talking about. One is putting them into regulatory criteria, which will be our third speaker, John Bishop. But there are things that we can be using them for even before we get to the regulatory context. And one of those is a project that Martha is working on where she's already starting to use some of the outputs of Nina's work. So what she's going to do is talk to you about that project and how she's importing the information from Nina and some of the complexities that work from the kind of thing that Nina's doing to the applications itself. So with that, Martha, you're up. Okay, thank you, Steve. So I'm, I'm assuming that, that you can see my uh, slide view just fine. <clears throat> we can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, so Steve sort of led off with uh, uh, one of the um, OAH expert panel recommendations was to be able to use models to investigate uh, uh, both um, ocean acidification and hypoxia vulnerability. Um, and the potential for uh, local pollution impact or local, local pollution to impact um, th that vulnerability. And so, um, you know, one of the key messages of this talk is that uh, Jim McWilliams, uh, UCLA, along with Curtis Deutsch of the University of Washington, have been leading a team of 15 scientists to develop this, this model. It's um, at the scale of the uh, entire California current. It's been validated. And now we're moving into beginning to think about how we're applying um, this model for um, both the evaluation of local pollution sources as well as other marine resource applications. Oops. There was a bit of a delay. Hold on, I'm just going to catch up for a second. Okay, so one of the things that's important to understand is that when we're thinking about um, making assessment of local pollution of so sources along the California coast, California actually has some pretty significant sources. Uh, for example, um, uh, we have a combination of ocean outfalls, particularly um, uh, discharging to San Francisco Bay as well as um, in the Southern California Bight that re represent um, and a, a large coastal population, and those outfalls contribute um, what we're estimating to be approximately 70, 75% of the total nitrogen exports to the coastline. So significant anthropogenic inputs, and what we also understand through some preliminary modeling is that those, um, those inputs, at least within the Southern California Bight, have um, basically doubled the available nitrogen in the nearshore. 
At the same time, we have other types of sources like um, uh, local CO2 uh, domes produced by, um, through urban areas, in particular Los Angeles. So this graphic on the right-hand side is showing you an example of that outwelling of CO2 um, onto the coastline. The question is, uh, are these uh, sources having an impact on acidification and hypoxia? And so we really need models to be able to figure this out. So one of the key messages today is that um, these local pollution impact um, assessments that we're engaging in now are actually an opportunity to apply these OA thresholds that are in development in advance of some formal action by the State Water Board with respect to um, an OA water quality objective. Uh, so, you know, what you should understand is that the, the biologically relevant acidification thresholds are a key ingredient of these local pollution impact assessments, you know, the way in which we understand how we can interpret the model output. And um, as we're starting to work on case studies of local pollution um, impact assessment, we are working through at the very same time through some basic principles of how to apply those thresholds to model output. And you can imagine, you know, there's a lot of typical focus on what the number is, but actually I think the devil is absolutely in the details with respect to the duration at which you're applying that threshold, um, the, the spatial extent, and how frequently um, those impacts have to occur in order to have a significant population level effect. And so our approach to this is to work with both the um, scientists, the modelers, um, the biologists, the, the oceanographers, as well as uh, engaging stakeholders to really try to get a consensus on some of these basic um, principles and approaches. So just a little bit of background on the basic um, uh, approach of the modeling system developed by University of, uh, uh, um, by UCLA and University of Washington. So as a reminder, the model starts out with um, a four kilometer grid at the California current scale, um, but then ha is nested in, um, with um, uh, increasingly finer resolution as you come offshore all the way from one kilometer at the, uh, the entire um, uh, state of California coastal butter scale, um, all the way down to 300 meters um, as we're coming on shore and, and focusing on uh, particular regions, for example, the Southern California Bight, uh, the Central Coast, and the uh, San Francisco Coast. The model has three main components. It, has, it starts with an atmospheric model, um, uh, referred to as WORF, the Weather and Research Forecast Model, which forces the physical model, um, which in which um, the basis for which is the Regional Ocean Modeling System, or ROMS, and that is coupled to a, a chemistry and a lower ecosystem model, in which we're simulating the, bio, um, the biogeochemistry, essentially how nutrients and carbon from the ocean, land, and atmosphere are forced um, and uptaken uh, through phytoplankton uptake, and zooplankton, and then how that ultimately impacts the carbon budget and influences oxygen and, and the carbonate system. And so what this modeling, what this model is doing is predicting the mechanistic linkages of that oceanic atmospheric and terrestrial forcing on OAH. Um, the model has uh, variable uh, uh, depth levels represented through its grid. And so um, for each of these grid cells um, across the entire um, scale of this um, of the grid, you're essentially producing uh, within each grid a time series of information. So you essentially have a four-dimensional four picture of the ocean with respect to its exposure of oxygen um, and, uh, and pH and related uh, parameters. Okay, so as you can imagine, you know, while we have this state-of-the-art model, um, it is an absolute blessing, and it's um, absolutely worth the investment being made in it, but at the same time, it's also kind of a curse. And so the idea is that the model, um, when you're building it at this scale, contains a huge amount of information. It has, it's tracking more than 35 state variables, um, from ocean physics to nutrients to uh, phytoplankton and how that's influencing organic matter, oxygen, and carbonate. Uh, so it has also um, uh, roughly about, at the scale of four kilometers, 66 um, million grid cells for multiple years. So the question is, how do you take all this information and translate it into some estimate of pollution impact? And what is considered a significant impact from local pollution in, um, sources? And so Nina started to get at these questions with respect to what habitats and what focal taxa and what thresholds. But ultimately, other questions like what is the spatial extent and duration of impact that's biologically significant are also part of what we need to figure out 
in order to be able to get to the end of this local pollution impact assessment. So uh, we're working through some of these, what I refer to as basic, basic principles um, in the first local impact um, assessment case study in the Southern California Bight. Um, and essentially our approach to this is uh, first um, kind of thinking at, um, of the Bight as a, as a nested uh, group of subregions along the coastline. What we want to do is bite wide conduct a preliminary pollution impact assessment in which we're, um, first of all, identifying by subregion along the coastline where pollution impact is essentially greater than model uncertainty. And when we think about model uncertainty, that's essentially defined by the validation processes. And what you, what you, it's helpful to understand is that the, the thresholds that we're using to interpret acidification and hypoxia impacts are actually really forcing a discussion about what are the temporal and spatial scales in which the model needs to perform um, in order to uh, get to the bottom of model uncertainty. And so we're really focusing the model validation at this scales and this first impact assessment, and we're expecting to have uh, the first set of results this fall. So the, the simulations are being run as we speak. And then as we get through that first impact assessment, if we find that pollution impact at each of these subregions is greater than uncertainty, then we're gonna be going through a more focused pollution impact assessment, looking at source attribution, uh, you know, what's the pathway in which um, it's being impacted, outfalls, rivers, atmospheric, are they point sources, are they non-point sources, are they natural sources, and then um, going through a series of scenarios looking at both pollution uh, management and climate change impacts together. So this is the, the basic appro approach that we're using in this case study. And then what I wanted to share with you is the discussions that we're already having, even before we're looking at model output, uh, you know, um, trying to get some consensus on how we evaluate that output to actually answer the question. So we, so we have a couple of um, basic principles that, that are basically in discussion right now. <clears throat> and I'm going to kind of walk through them, <clears throat> not to give you the idea that we've already kind of sewn this up, but we've sort of agreed on some ideas that we want to test out, and then I'm sure that that's going to fuel some additional discussion. So principle number one, I think that the idea is that with, the, with the respect to the output that we're dealing with, what we're really assessing is the compression, both spatial and temporal, of benthic and pelagic habitats. The idea of the impact assessment is that we should be able to assess the change in volume um, um, that, that results from, the, from the, this anthropogenic forcing, um, both you know, from before you, you force the model and then what happens afterwards. So change in volume, if you're looking at pelagic habitat, change in um, area, if we're talking about benthic habitat. And then we're not just looking at um, habitat compression in space, we're also looking at it in time. And so our pteropod uh, experts really had a hand in providing some direct recommendations for how do we think about that. Um, and they recommended using um, uh, some uh, metrics that allow us to look at the change in duration as well as the change in intensity relative to some threshold X, <clears throat> for example, and then the integration of those two measures, which um, is defined as severity, which is duration times, uh, times intensity. So, you know, here is an example where we engage the pteropod experts up front during this first workshop to try to get them to provide some recommendations on applications, and I think that that gives the modelers a lot more confidence in terms of how they're going about doing their assessments. Another question, so what threshold do we use? Well, in this case, um, ultimately, if we're talking about a pollution impact assessment and that's a regulatory action, it may actually be a policy decision. But for the moment, what the scientists have chosen to do is supply um, the, um, the thresholds, and so here you're seeing six thresholds, essentially try to um, choose the bookends of risk to understand how the choice in threshold affects the magnitude of impact. So here we, we can actually use the model and, and run these thresholds through the model to support conversations about what is the most appropriate threshold to use. And so for this first preliminary impact assessment, what we're doing is choosing what would be essentially considered by the regulators as a lethal versus sublethal endpoint. And we're also including and paying attention to the duration recommendations that are coming from directly from that information in terms of how we will aggregate the model output over time um, in order to make this assessment. 
Okay, so another big question, and sort of Nina brought this up um, previously as well, okay, if we have these univariate OA thresholds, which is really the format in which, uh, you know, John would be, um, mm -hmm. uh, would rather have um, the information in order to be able to think about a potential policy action, but let's be realistic, this is a multi-stressor environment. So how do we apply the OA thresholds in this sort of, um, complicated multi-stressor space? And so the idea I want to put out on the table that is that, first of all, um, what, the, what this HSI model has the potential to do is really provide a realistic estimate of potential habitat. Think about your pollution impact assessment essentially being a ratio between um, the habitat that is available after the Im pollution impact divided by the potential available habitat without pollution. And so um, what you use to calculate this denominator is actually a big deal. So if we're looking at just OA, if I'm showing you this graphic on the left-hand side, we're looking at OA, um, uh, essentially constrained habitat. <clears throat> um, you can see that with anthropogenic forcing, you may be reducing that volume by about uh, 10%. But if you consider what HSI can inform with respect to what is the total available habitat, um, uh, uh, considering something like temperature, all of a sudden you realize that um, you actually have much less um, original, much less habitat than you originally thought because of the interaction of OA and, uh, of OA and temperature. And that would actually um, uh, cause you to realize that the, the potential pollution, pollution impact could be actually much greater, something like 30% versus 10% as an example. So the idea is that we can use these tools in combination to try to figure out um, what is a realistic um, estimate of the, of the potential impact of pollution? Okay, so that's an, some ex three examples of where we've had discussions and trying to try to get towards consensus, and we have some good good starting points for how we're going to be applying it for this preliminary impact assessment. But I think a key point is that there are a lot of other really important questions still in play. A um, couple examples of that. One thing that Nina had talked about is that what we're really trying to do, and something that has, I think, an important regulatory precedent, is that you know we're trying to protect the sustainability of populations, not down to every last individual. Great, okay, so if that's what we're trying to do, what is the extent of habitat compression that actually re represents a significant uh, population level effect? So this is an important question that I think that we're uh, wrestling with and that we don't necessarily have a lot of clarity yet, um, and I will probably be using the model to actually provide some scenarios back to the biologist in order to um, force some, uh, some additional discussion. Another example is, you know, ultimately what one John's questions would be, or a regulator's question uh, would be, was what is the critical period for biological impacts? Um, and so what we may be actually forced to do is try to understand how we can use the thresholds in different ways and see what gives us, you know, see what is the most sensitive endpoint. Are we, um, is it the long-term survival and reproduction of adults that, that's actually going to force um, a more uh, a sensitive endpoint, or is it really more about assuring um, larval recruitment and using the thresholds in that way, in which case we need to be much more tuned in to the seasons um, in, which, in which they're recruiting. So these are all really important questions um, that I think that we really start to clarify what is what are the major gaps in the threshold science that that need to be um, uh, focused on in order for for us to really be able to form this work going into the future. Okay, so I'm going to end on sort of this note that you know I talked about um, uh, vulnerability. I've talked about pollution impact as the as the major uh, sort of focus of today's talk. But these basic principles are relevant for other threshold applications, vulnerability assessment, assessment of um, the efficacy of mitigation strategies, and there is clearly a, a big need for interplay between um, the scientists working on threshold development and the scientists who are really engaged in application um, in terms of being able to focus key questions and data gaps um, that need to be addressed um, with future research and also for the need to really get to the bottom and try to get as much st uh, scientific consensus and stakeholder engagement. So we're essentially moving forward and having a consistent way in which we're interpreting um, the impacts of ocean acidification and ultimately hypoxia on the coastline. So with that, I will end and I think I'm gonna uh, uh, turn it, I believe, over to John. Thank you.
So thank you very much, Martha. Uh, John, if, or I think, uh, Haley, you're gonna pull up John's slides for him, if you could do that now. Um, yep, doing that now. So the, the lead in to this is that Martha did a great job of talking about the short game. How can we be using uh, the kind of things that Nina's doing uh, at the present time in non-regulatory context and, and really the need for interplay between scientists and the users of this information. Um, uh, John Bishop, as the Chief Deputy Director for the State Water Board, is going to now talk to us a little bit about the long game, um, how you go about taking the science and translating it into criteria. John, you're up. Great. And Haley, if you can advance to my first slide, and um, that would be great. And I apologize that I'm just n not able to do it myself. But so what you heard so far gives me some um, hope that we can move forward. There's a, a lot of good information that's, that um, both uh, Nina and Martha um, talked about. But what I really need is, uh, is really to answer four questions before I can move forward with any sort of um, development of a criteria. And there is, you know, is there um, something that the state water board can do about it. So is there a need that we can address? Can we, um, can we actually um, develop a link between what we regulate, we regulate discharges um, from um, non-point and point sources. Is there a consensus on what we should be regulating? And um, is there a consensus on what um, level those should be um, regulated at that has an uh, adverse impact. So I'm going to talk about each one of those for a, a minute um, and then um, move on to my initial impressions. If you can move forward, Haley, um, <clears throat> to the next slide. Um, so when we talk about a management need, what we're talking about is, is there a um, is there something that the state water board regulates, things like uh, uh, POTWs, publicly owned treatment works, is their discharge impacting the, um, the, um, the local taxa in a way that um, is significant? And so um, essentially, do we need to be uh, um, reducing the amount of nitrogen or nutrients discharged um, from our sources. And even if it is impacting it, is it impacting it at a um, level that's sufficient to, um, to warrant us doing that? When we're talking about um, something like denitrification of a, a ocean outfall of a sewage treatment plant, we're talking billions of dollars for each one of those. Uh, is what we're seeing is the impact associated with these point sources significant when compared to looking at um, upwelling or CO2 um, contribution from atmosphere? So we need to know that what we're doing is um, is going to have a a, a a impact on the um, adverse effects. Next slide. Then, can we actually develop this uh, causal link? Can we say, if you discharge a certain level of nutrients um, above which we're going to see this impact? Because we may know that there is an impact associated with um, nutrient discharge, but if we can't, um, if we can't develop a link between what level of nutrient discharge is causing the problem, then we, we don't have a handle on how to regulate it because we're not going to be um, regulating er erogenic saturation. We're going to be regulating inputs into a, the nutrient cycle. And so there's, that's the second question and we're, um, that we need to be addressing. Next slide. All right. Now, what should we be? Um, what is the parameter that 
um, we should be assessing. Um, I know this says to, to regulate, but I think we're really talking about at this point what is the endpoint in the um, in the environment where we're seeing this adverse impact, and then related to the causal link that I talked about just a minute ago. Um, what we saw is that for um, pteropods, it seems to be heading towards arachnite saturation, but um, it, the uh, kernodermis might be pH, and it might be something else for crustaceans. We'll need to figure out which one of those is most sensitive, or do we need to have multiple lines, and can, how do we um, how do we relate them together? Um, and this is uh, going to be critical if we're going to to be developing some sort of regulatory scheme. Next slide. Um, and then, which are the most sensitive species? Is, um, Nina talked about the studies going on for three different taxa, and when we get through that process. Can we identify which one is the most sensitive um, um, to, to address? Can we, can we essentially identify that, which if we protect that, we protect um, um, all the others and using it as a um, as an indicator species? And how does that relate to the natural background? Um, are we going to be able to, to, to distinguish the point sources and their impacts um when we look at the um the changing conditions in the um in the ocean next slide so a little bit about um what i heard and um where i think we're going the model seems to provide us with some of the uh, uh um appropriate mechanisms to establish um, is there an impact. But we're still going to have to have um, a, a lot of work on is that model um, adequate? Is it going to, is it sensitive enough? Are there, uh, are the folks that are going to be um, asked to bear the brunt of any changes? Do they, are they involved in um, the development? We'll need to be bringing this, um, these folks into that uh, um, conversation as we move forward. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so the last thing that I need is um, a, a dueling set of, um, of, of folks out there talking about what we should be protecting as the sensitive species. So we need to be working towards consensus on, um, on where that should go. Um, oh. <laughs> One second, will we get back? Um, Sorry about that. It, no worries. And it looks like um, what the work that Nina is doing is heading us in that right direction. But I do have some concerns. Um, when you start incorporating multiple stressors, it becomes very complicated to, um, to, to make that link between discharge and, um, and the outcome in the environment. Um, on one hand, when we're looking at uh, um, assessment of the condition, we can we can um, uh, the word excuse me, we can take into account temperature or um, other confounding factors because we, we're doing an assessment. It's a lot harder when you're trying to then link that to a, a, a level of discharge of of input into that um, to include um, that temperature or other. So we need to really figure out how important those um, multi-stressors are and how are we going to interact with those stressors for um, 
for looking at the input sources, the nutrient sources that come into it. Next. So, assuming we can get through those other, um, those baseline questions, then what we have to do is take all that information and develop a story that, um, that we can describe to policy makers, non-scientists. How do you take all that information and develop a story which is compelling to, um, to policy makers who may not have that level of technical background to embrace the idea of spending public money on um, a large amount of it, likely, on a um, regulatory action that will address the problem. Um, putting that story together then includes preparing a regulatory package, which includes a, a, a sequel analysis on the um, impacts associated with mitigating the problem, it has to go through um, scientific peer review, um, which should be helpful in this situation since there's been a lot of science going on in the beginning. We have to go out for multiple interactions with our uh, regulatory community and the public, which includes um, uh, public comments and responses to comments, workshops and hearings, and then goes for approval by the State Water Resource Control Board, then has to go to the Office of Administrative Law to, to ensure that we've followed all the uh, procedural steps and that this is um, actually something that needs to be done and finally has to go to US EPA for their approval. That just sets up the plan or the, the goal, the objectives that we're trying to do. To actually implement that, so then they have to be, uh, permits need to be amended, um, which is another step in the process. So we're, um, it's a fairly long process and I'll get to that at the, at the end. Next slide. Um, but we should note that they, that they policy could take a number of different approaches. Um, it could be a narrative um, objective, which talks about um, something like um, um, marine communities, including um, vertebrates, invertebrates, and plant species shall not be degraded, or that, um, that um, or it might be a little more specific that the, um, the uh, aragonite saturation level will not drop below a certain value which impacts um, um, marine species. It could um, have a narrative that, um, that uses the different endpoints as um, guidance for insisting, for um, interpreting the, um, that narrative value. Our most famous one that we've had for a long time is that there shall be no toxics in toxic amounts. That's the narrative in um, our uh, many of our water quality control plans, and then we use um, different metrics to um, to support that. Or it could be a a, a um, numeric value that might be single value or multiple, such as um, a uh, an equation or a, a line describing um, aragonite saturation and temperature, and that the combination of those two can't um, um, exceed the 50% um, uh, mortality or, or some other metrics of that type. And the next slide. And finally, I, I want to caution folks that um, policy making is, is not a quick action. It's it generally, um, once we have the science settled or fairly settled, it's a minimum of 18 months to two years to go through that process of developing the document, putting it out for public comment, revis um, having um, hearings and workshops um, and focused stakeholder meetings, and then um, um, bringing it for uh, board consideration. But on the other hand, I say that it's, uh, it's normally a, a, a pretty long process and with something this um, potentially impactful, it likely will be, but we have, um, been known to move more quickly in, in when there is a um, a, a um, recognized need. I'll use, for example, that um, we've been trying to do 
um, flow levels um, for um, anadromous fish in the north coast for about 10 years. Um, but two years ago, the legislature decided that um, we were going to make um, marijuana um, or cannabis cultivation legal in California and required us to come up with interim flow um, levels to protect anadromous fish um, within nine months. And we did. Um, they're not perfect and they're, um, they have some problems, but we were able to do it in a very short time frame um, under the mandates that we needed. So um, I think I will end there and um, thank you all very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, John. So what we've heard now are three presentations, one about the science, one about applications in the short term, one about applications towards criteria in the long term. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go till 930, providing the opportunity for uh, people who serve on the ocean acidification uh, and hypoxia task force to ask questions first. Um, those in the general audience, uh, please use the chat system to pose your questions and we'll go to those starting at 930. So with that, panelists, uh, you all should be unmuted at this point. Um, any of you have questions you'd like to pose for any of the speakers? Uh, this is Dick Feely. Um, I'd like to ask a question to John. It seems to me that when we look at the effluent itself, it's not just the nutrient concentrations that we should be concerned about, but also other components of the effluent that it may affect the um, pH or aragonite saturation state. And both the carbon chemistry and perhaps organic matter and other components. Is there an ongoing effort to do that? Is that information available? And can that then go into the models to understand the overall impact on pH and aragonite saturation in the receiving environment? Is that feasible to do that? So uh, I don't know the exact answer to that. We, we monitor those discharges quite heavily and look at lots of, um, of different parameters and what are their, um, how they change and what are their timing. I'm not sure that the right ones have been, um, are being monitored or at the sensitivity um, that is needed, but I'll need feedback from the, from the science community on if, if there are other factors besides nutrients um, that need to be um, monitored at uh, what kind of frequency and sensitivity is that monitoring? And then we can see if we've got that data or if we need to be asking folks to, to uh, collect it. Uh, this is Jim Barry. Um, I have a question for Jonathan. First, I'd like to thank Nina, Martha, and John for great presentations. It was really nice to see sort of the science end to the policy end integrated like that. But the question for Jonathan, I was really interested in the difficulty of coping with multi-stressor policy development. And the question is, should the science community and the expert panel try to condense the multi-stressor context into a single stressor measurement that might be regionally specific? So for the Southern California bite, should we, in our scientific work, try and look at multiple stressors, but then in communicating this or in summarizing this, try to single out pH or temperature or some other parameter or legislation or provide information on that level. So um, generally, it is easier for um, an regulatory concept to have a single parameter that we're looking at because it, it makes um, communication of that um, <clears throat> and interpretation of that more straightforward. But as I said, we have done in the past. Um, if you look at um, the criteria for ammonia in freshwater, it's temperature dependent and it's life cycle dependent. And so it is a, a multivariate and it is, but it, it, um, it tends in the end to look at 
um, when you're regulating the discharge to look at, okay, what is the most um, sensitive um, temperature and life cycle? And then that becomes the, um, the regulatory driver in the permit. Um, not always, but usually that's the case because it's really hard for someone to, to manage their POTW on, a, um, on an equation as opposed to on a, um, a value that you're trying to meet. Okay, thank you. Other task force members have questions. I, I have a question. Um, hi, this is Francis, and I have a question for, for Nina. But first, thank you all. These were, were fantastic, very informative presentations. Nina, I want to ask you about um, your threshold work. And there's two points. <coughs> One is that in, in your meta analyses, did you see, were there attributes of studies that made them more or less useful? So the ones that you end up using, there's some properties about them, the kinds of work that, that just made them much more easy to translate into analysis. And the second question is that, so you have two options. You have the, the, the straight, straight up physiological meta-analyses and you have kind of a pure uh, uh, correlative habitat suitability index. Between those two things, what, what's more important? Um, can, we, can we just use one versus the other, or should we put more of our, our, our attention towards field measurements, for example, because of the, the inference to population dynamics? So yeah, two questions, if you can share your thoughts on that. Nina, you'll have to unmute yourself. All right, so I'm not sure if I exactly understood your first questions, but I think maybe I can start with the second one and you can guide me if I haven't tackled your first one. So uh, comparison between the meta-analysis and correlation analysis is really useful because, uh, and I, I think both of the approaches should be used simultaneously because meta-analysis is very good for a univariate stressor, doesn't capture, for example, couple of different stressors, it can just give you the response. So for example, we have done some meta-analysis combining OA and temperature as well, and we have seen that the magnitude of the responses is being changed, but how that exactly leads to the thresholds, that's not straightforward. So meta-analysis actually supports the univariate stressor much more um, as, as, you know, combination with the multiple stressor. And the second issue is then, so the multiple stressors can then be resolved through the correlation analysis. So I wouldn't necessarily exclude one on the, uh, for the other, but basically have two comparative approaches and see how one aligns to the other because you can actually extract, extract much more information out of that. In terms of how you translate the meta-analysis directly to the field or what is really missing parameter in there, I think meta-analysis is just maybe more of a transitional step that can help you guide the threshold analysis much more in the further steps, but not per se very useful to figure out what is going on in the field. I'm, I absolutely concur with you that we need more uh, field data and in particular testing the experimental uh, thresholds in the field and see how that is. For some of the threshold, that's gonna be fairly easy. For example, for the solution and, and classification, we can track that in situ quite well. For some of the other survival, that's not the case. So in those particular cases, you really need to devise the best way how you use experimental thresholds and try to predict what is happening in situ. So um, did I answer at least your second question? And maybe you can. Uh, yeah, you did. The first one. Yeah. And maybe the first one was that, you know, given that there, there's often so many studies to put into meta analyses, you know, are, are, do, do some, some stand out as, wow, that was particularly useful and that was particularly useful because they did X, Y, or Z? Is that something that, that you were able to, to pull out at this point? Yeah, I know what you're talking. You're, so some of the meta-analyses that I have seen uh, currently are maybe just focusing on one particular parameter, for example, feeding rate across different functional groups. We're trying to use meta-analysis more as a comprehensive look, try to see a variety of different processes, and potentially even try to understand how they work together, kind of like getting to that cumulative impact that by looking at particular uh, parameter alone, you will not be able to get to. So there are a variety of ways how you could use the meta-analysis indeed and specifying mm -hmm. 
what you want to do for a particular functional groups, for a variety of functional groups. I think for ours, it's really more important that we tackle the combination of different response measures. And I think what I see being done at last, so we're going to have meta-analysis and the univariate stressor and the multiple stressors for teropods and for all the other taxa. And then meta-analysis can really help us bring all these different taxa together and have a comparison between that because I believe that through that we could really tackle the question of like, what is the most sensitive process and what is the most sensitive taxa, which goes back directly to John's comment of, let's try to figure out what is the most sensitive organisms and how, they, how different taxa have this comparable measure. So at the very end, I think putting, meta, putting all the results of all functional groups and responses together into one big meta-analysis is really gonna try to help us establish who is the most sensitive and how these different uh, response measures align uh, uh, along this uh, declining biological gradient. Thank you. Thank you. Then, you know, let me build off of what Francis's question. Um, one of the th we have a number of scientists who are on this discussion. Um, as you put these studies together, you've worked across a whole variety of studies. Um, what are the attributes of the studies that you have found that make them most useful in your integration? What are the attributes of the studies that you found to essentially invalidate or lessen the value of, of the studies? Almost in a sense an advice to people who are doing these kinds of studies about how they can make them most relevant to the kind of thing that you're trying to work towards. Yeah, so I think uh, we could really um, uh, learn a lot from different steps as we're going across. So for example, meta-analysis can help us identify which of the responses are insignificant, right? So they really wouldn't impact the organism so much. They could also help, meta-analysis can help us guide which are the most sensitive responses. And maybe you can focus on that particular um, response if you're interested in more specificity um, of the response in particular functional group. I think people have to think that not all life stages are equally um, sensitive. So trying to tease out the life history effect uh, is very important. And then of course the species effect as well. So species from various different latitudes are basically inhabiting different habitats. How does this pre acclimation to a certain conditions impact their sensitivity? So maybe species that will see more variability in their natural environment might be actually affected by by OA very differently than what somebody who doesn't have that immediate exposure in their natural environment. So I think um, species specificity, life stages, and the most sensitivity process they can track are some of the attributes that people should be paying attention to. Thank you. Other task force members, questions? Uh, I've got one. This is Jim Barry. This is for Nina again. And I really liked the, your presentation of the different sensitivities among life stages of theropods. And as we're trying to protect populations or consider the consequences of OA and other stressors for populations, I wonder how important you think it is to involve population modelers in this, because although larvae may be assumed to be the most, a big driver, or larval survival may be a large driver for many populations, and it's often assumed to be, it may not be. It may be, even though the, the effects are smaller, or the effect size could be smaller for the adults, that may be the driver rather than the greater sensitivity for larvae or eggs. And do you have any comments about the important to understand demographic dynamics through modeling in relation to some of the sensitivity studies that we've seen? Yes, I, I think this is fundamental. And th the very next step, stage of what we are doing needs to be incorporated in the demographics model, I agree. Because without that, we can have, you know, some sort of insights of what the experiments are showing us, but that might not be a, a real population bottleneck. So indeed, these same exposures have to be integrated into the population demographic model because they might give us actually different results. I remember we were doing that for terabots and recognized that the population, the demographics model actually gave us different sensitivity of life stages that we initially thought or the meta-analysis pointed out to be the most sensitive. So I agree the next step should definitely be a, a population model. Yes, I support that 100%. I agree, thanks. I have a couple questions for Nina. Nina, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was um, lovely to see all of that work combined in one place. 
two questions for you. One on your meta-analysis. Um, I'm not sure if I missed it, but did, could you talk a little bit about the difference in sensitivity among species? Because I'm imagining that there are a variety of different species included. Um, and then my second question uh, was about the habitat suitability index model and um, your thoughts on how to test it. And you know that I've thought a lot about Puget Sounds, and it's just one of these really curious places, like how do pteropods exist in Puget Sound? Um, and I know I don't think your model goes into, into the sound, but could you talk about like how these types of anomalies are, are going to help you refine that, that yeah. modeling suite? Yeah, okay, so in terms of um, species sensitivity in meta-analysis, uh, particularly for pterobots, we have actually found that um, there are different regions from which these different species are uh, basically mm, coming from that have different um, sensitivity, with West Coast species, pteropod species being actually the most sensitive, and uh, temporal species being actually less sensitive, that being said, if you now go more specific into different life stages of this um, of this um, species from different uh, latitudes, that might also change. So, yes, the sensitivity in general is very much related to the regional gradients. But if you look into life stages of the specific species, that might also be different. So, in that particular sense. Uh, you have to realize, I mean, that's a complex issue, really, because even if, for example, one particular stage of, say, temporal species might not show sensitivity in the meta-analysis, maybe through the population demographics model, uh, that would not turn out to be the case. In that particular, particular case, I think what we were trying to do is try to establish if the magnitude of the response is somehow comparable um, for um, the data to be included together uh, in order than these specific thresholds to be used across different species. Um, and I think in general, we have found some agreement which regions we, ch we should include, but also recognize um, which of the regions we should be paying more attention to because the, the sensitivity should be different. We were particularly surprised that, for example, tropical pteropod species on which we you know, widely believe that living uh, under much higher saturation state uh, would not be so impacted, actually turns out that they have that particular sensitivity and current lack of data on tropical species currently prevents us from, from uh, being more specific about that. But meta-analysis, for example, really um, recognize the, the importance of doing more uh, research work on tropical species because of that high um, sensitivity. Okay, and the other question, how to validate the HSIs. Um, I think if you're only basically doing the empirical HSI work, it's really difficult to, to find some um, find uh, validity in the field data, especially if you're dealing with short-term data sets over one or two seasons, right? That, that would be difficult to, to establish. But if you are building your HSI model from the mechanistic point of view, so you're trying to first uh, delineate the HSI based on what your experiments are telling you, and then you validate your mechanistic HSI in situ, uh, so basically compare mecha mechanistic and empirical HSI, then you might be actually in a much better position to, to validate what your um, field data is showing. So I recommend doing the experimental work with similar uh, experimental conditions as you see in the natural conditions. So try to mimic these scenarios as best as possible, and then you'll be in much better position in extrapolating the experimental um, the results to, to the field data and validate it. Thank you, Nina. So task force members, we're going to put you on the sideline for a moment. We have uh, about a dozen or half a dozen to a dozen questions that have come in through the chat box from the audience. And we're going to go to those questions now. Haley, um, I hope you've been. Thank you. Those, and we're going to ask you in whatever order you select uh, to verbalize those questions and also let the, the, the people know uh, who's asking them. Okay, great. Yes, the first question is from Phil Markle. So I think this would be to Nina, but perhaps also Jonathan about the feasibility of something like this, but would a practical application of the habitat suitability index result in use of different indicators in different areas? For example, pteropods are not a good indicator in the South because of the HSI, 
but habitat conditions for echinoderms might be more appropriate for the south. Is that something you guys are looking into and is that feasible? Start with Nina. Uh, so I would say it's maybe not the message we wanted to get across. It's Theropods are not good in the south because of the HSI. It's exactly the opposite. They are excellent in the south because they are actually portraying that the conditions are actually not good. So low suitability of HSI denotes that these are not good conditions and that corresponds to theropod low abundance numbers or even complete absence. So just the opposite excellent indicator for indicating the low suitability of conditions. So um, uh, and it's very good that we have actually the range of low versus high HSI to then depict which of the regions would actually be more suitable. In terms of echinoderms, um, we have to test the model. So basically we need field data, we need to couple it with physical chemical data and build the HSI model to be able to, to um, you know, recognize the region where the HSI, so habitat suitability, will be appropriate for echinoderms and where not. So it's not one model. We are building a couple of different models for each species um, specific model. Uh, but it's very important that we use the biological information together with physical chemical information and, and build it based on that. And then we can also validate the historical data that I know Phil or some other regulatory agency have. And we can go backwards and see if the HSI conditions will be changing in time as well. Great, thank you. So we have another question from Emily Knight at the Landfest Ocean Program at Pew. This is really important work that is leading the way on this issue. My question is, SCORP is working closely with the California State Water Boards. Is there other coordination happening with the other states, Oregon and Washington, regulators, and or the US EPA? And this might actually be for you, Steve. Others are welcome to join too. So um, <sighs> Right now, we have a California Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Task Force, um, and so really the focus has been um, uh, of the task force on California. However, um, Jen Phillips is on the line, um, and Jen is responsible for cross-state coordination. Um, so I know that she has been working with the other states. Um, Jen, maybe you'd like to weigh in kind of where we're at uh, in the interactions with the other with the other states on the West Coast. Let's see if Jen's on the line. I don't know if she connected her audio. Ah, okay. So she might be in listen only mode. Um, so so I'll, Steve, I'll, Steve, I'll, I'd, I'd like to jump in just by sort of mentioning even before you go that, that there's actually quite a bit of scientific collaboration going on, um, at least through the uh, Washington Department of Ecology. Um, Nina has a project um, in which she's working with um, um, model um, modelers uh, for Puget Sound to be able to try to start to apply these acidification thresholds to a pollution impact assessment that the Washington uh, Department of Ecology is, is doing. And so, you know, we're already reaching out and thinking about informal um, collaborations. We recognize that the more we have um, different opportunities, different scenarios to apply this information, the more the more we'll we will learn and try to get consensus in sort of the early stages about how to approach it. So that's just one, one example. And, you know, maybe um, I think there are others. Nina has ongoing collaborations um, with a number of scientists, for example, on um, kelp, uh, the potential application of, of kelp for mitigation. And it could be that she ends up, ends up using these thresholds to be able to interpret impacts in, in that capacity as well. I think that's a great addition, Martha. It's kind of entirely consistent with the seminars that what we're trying to do at the regulatory level has a longer term play out and requires a different set of interactions, but there are a lot of scientific interactions and shorter term applications which are happening. Um, Haley, why don't you great. go ahead with the next question? Okay, I think this one is for Jonathan Bishop. How must the POTW respond if policy is changed while in the middle of an EPA permit cycle? So, um, you know, I didn't go into all the details, but generally, uh, when the permit is adopted, it doesn't go into, uh, when the policy is adopted, it doesn't go into effect immediately. It has to be incorporated into a permit. And um, that's generally done at the next permit cycle. And additionally, um, unless it's a, um, in most instances, there's a time schedule associated with that because any kind of uh, upgrades to a treatment plant take, um, Funding, time, planning, timing, and construction, and so it would not be um, it wouldn't be 
imposed on someone in the middle of their permit. It would be incorporated into an either amendment to the permit or the next update, and then a time schedule to to um, to implement that. Um, and that would be um, determined at the time of the permit how long it's needed. And um, usually the POTW would be asked for uh, to give a um, their um, time frame that they would need, and then there's a, a policy discussion about is that a, a reasonable time frame. I did want to jump in real quick on the question that Phil Markle had on um, spatial. Um, there's a potential for lots of different ways to look at the criteria. Um, one approach that comes to mind is that you could look at what is the most sensitive or appropriate species, and so you might have different um, species with different thresholds depending on which is the most sensitive in that area and that you'd have to do that analysis for your area before you made the determination. Thanks. Uh, Helia, you're up. Next question. Great. So our next question is from Nicole Martinson. She's the chair of the Surfrider Foundation Mendocino County Chapter. We are looking to expand our ocean water quality monitoring to test beyond E. coli and Enthero. Is there a recommendation for how to test pH that would contribute data on a citizen science level? Are there other assays that would be helpful for future OA studies that we and other California Surfrider chapters could be testing for? So maybe, maybe I'll take that, sure one, that one. Yeah, maybe I'll take that one um, to say that there was a webinar that we did a few months ago, oh. first of our webinars, that might be useful for you to go back and take a look at, uh, because the state of California is right now doing a gaps analysis to figure out where we're monitoring, where we're not monitoring. And a group like Surfrider Foundation, which is located uh, across the state, might be a great organization to help fill in some of those gaps. Um, so essentially that's the spatial component. Then there's this, the other component of how well do you do it um, and how do you go about doing it. One of the things that we're very fortunate in the state to have are two um, groups called the SENCUS and SCUS, part of the National um, Integrated Ocean Observing System. They have taken on trying to facilitate uh, the, the monitoring of acidification and working with groups to help train them and help do quality control. So I would suggest that if you really want to follow up on that, they, they both have experts who go around and kind of help people as they're trying to develop these kinds of monitoring programs. Get in touch with them and they'll be able to tell you what methods are available and the costs and the quality control mechanisms you need to put in to make that useful. Next question. Great. Helen. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, our next one is from Fran at the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. Great presentations, thank you. The 50% mortality is just being used for the modeling, correct? That would not be used necessarily to establish the regulatory criteria. Concern that that might not be precautionary enough. I would pass this to Nina, perhaps Jonathan. Yeah, so the 50% mortality was uh, was used particularly for this type of modeling because we have incorporated the uh, mortality as an endpoint in our experiments data, but this has no connection to the regulatory criteria at all. I agree that this would not be precautionary enough. So we would have to look at some more early warning signals. So from from the regulatory point of view, this um, the decision on what at what level of protection um, is um, is the right one will be a part of the whole um, balancing that the um, regulatory agency, the state water board will have to do um, with increase in, um, in protection, the more conservative, the, um, the higher the, um, the cost will be associated with that. And so that will be looking at, all right, is, is a 50% mortality the right for population or is it, um, 10% mortality, um, is it um, dissolution of the um, shells? So there are um, the, the actual decision on what that will, uh, what that will end up will be a, a long and complicated process to, with a lot of discussion from different folks on how it should be set and a lot of different opinions on that. Haley, next question. <laughs> 
Great. So our next question is from Melissa Foley. I believe this is probably for Jonathan. How difficult will it be to get multiple regulatory agencies to work together so that we can think about multiple stressors instead of appealing to each regulator separately in order to make a compelling business case for investing in mitigation measures? So um, generally it's hard to get uh, multiple regulatory agencies to work together because they have different um, legal um, parameters that they work under. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'm, I'm not really sure um, where that is, um, what that's related to, but we work collaboratively with um, with the um, uh, State Lands Commission and the, um, the Coastal Commission and the State Water Board when we're looking at permits for um, ocean desalination so that we work jointly. We have different legal requirements that we're addressing, but we want to try and make sure that we're um, we're doing it in a coordinated fashion. So we can do that kind of thing, um, but it does take effort. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. So our next question is from Eric Lemons at Eco Green Group. My question are to clarify the task force's goal. What is the long-term goal of setting thresholds for regulation? Are we trying to slow the decline of the coastal food chain, or are we trying to stabilize the ocean food chain long-term? Would the regulatory thresholds be for each emitter, and would the regulatory thresholds be for the cumulative contribution of all California's contributors? So maybe, uh, Steve, take this first. There's a bunch of questions in there, but maybe clarifying the, the long-term goal of setting thresholds. Okay, um, so, so I think it really comes down to two very distinct kinds of things. One is, how do we interpret all the data that we are already collecting? So Martha gave three examples, I think there were three great examples, of decisions the state is presently trying to make. Um, decision number one is the project that she talked about, where you've got nutrient inputs that come in. It's been hypothesized that those nutrient inputs lead to algal growth. Algal growth leads to dead algae. Dead algae leads to CO2, and CO2 leads to acidification. So should we be um, essentially regulating the nutrient inputs? In order to do that, um, when she runs the model, she's got to figure out how much change you know, um, in nutrient inputs leads to how much change in acidification conditions and is that change meaningful? The kind of things that you're talking about at the population level are exactly, I think, where John is coming from. The second kind of thing that's in, in common use right now um, is uh, another example, uh, probably a webinar we'll be holding into the future, uh, is the uh, state's action plan, uh, at least its draft action plan, is suggesting that we should do what's called phytoremediation. If you build more plants, you know, you build, engineer, so that you have more habitat for plants, you do the planting, then the plants will remove nutrients, we remove CO2 from the water, the water will improve. Well, there's a cost associated with doing that. Um, and so what you want to know is, if, is the improvement that we get from doing the plants um, meaningful uh, relative to the cost? And the meaningfulness is exactly in the context of the question was just asked is, um, you know, is the population level changing? The fact that we save three pteropods probably is not meaningful. Um, are we really protecting a population level? Uh, the third uh, application, again, that we're thinking about for immediate use is vulnerability assessment. One of the things that, again, is in the state's action plan is trying to define which areas are most vulnerable, which areas are least vulnerable to future change because that will then help them identify where they're going to put their investments. And again, in order to define vulnerability, um, you know, if, if you've got an area that's vulnerable to you know, 8.1 pH, another group area that's vulnerable to 8.05 pH, is that a meaningful difference? At what point do you have to have enough meaningful difference that you call an area more vulnerable than another area? And so that would be another application. Again, with all those, as you referred to in the question, it comes down to not necessarily at the individual level, but at the population level. Great, thank you, Steve. So our next question is, I believe this is for Nina from Kim Andrews at NOAA PMEL in Washington. Why do you think pH works better as an indicator for echinoderms, whereas aragonite saturation works better for pteropods? 
Well, yeah, that's a good question. It, it doesn't, so the proposed pH for echinoderms was more, mostly derived from the fact that all of the experiments on the echinoderms were conducted with a difference in pH and not aragonite saturation state. So it's going to be difficult to justify it that all the sensitivity comes from saturation state. And that's in sharp contrast to the experiments with theropods that were all basically conducted uh, through the through changes in aragonite saturation state. That's why I think so experts have to rely on what is reported in the experimental data and that's why pH will work better for echinoderms just because the majority of the published data for the echinoderms um, goes by pH. That said, we have actually translated all the pH uh, for a kind of experiments uh, along the saturation state as well. And we actually have found very, very similar um, thresholds um, for echinoderms, regardless what we use for pH or aragonite saturation state. And I haven't mentioned that, but that conceptually gave us a, a, a big breakthrough because we started to realize that because pH and aragonite saturation state in the natural environment are well related, we could eventually uh, pinpoint to one particular parameter that could be used from regulatory point of view, and we don't have to have all the ones. But in the process, while we are just designing the thresholds to a particular parameter, based on the experimental data, we would be using pH and other organized saturation state. Great. Thank you, Nina. So I think this one is for Martha. This is from Stephanie Yeager. I appreciate the discussion of multiple stressors of temperature and OA. How does hypoxia and low dissolved oxygen play into this threshold development, especially since we already have criteria for dissolved oxygen? So Stephanie, that's a great question. Um, we really focused on the work on OA today and, and didn't talk at all about oxygen. But I'm going to, you know, kind of lay out a couple ideas. First of all, um, our existing DO objectives in the ocean plan have the very same problems that pH does with respect to uh, whether or not they're biologically relevant. They're really established um, to assess end of pipe impacts um, and can't really be an effective tool for a number of reasons uh, to allow us to assess uh, the impacts of hypoxia, um, particularly from um, these local pollution sources. And so what, you know, maybe part of the story that you'll see coming through maybe over the next several sets of webinars is that as Nina has been developing an approach which involves, you know, variant thresholds and um, uh, habitat suitability indices for OA, um, University of Washington, uh, Curtis Deutsch, and, you know, his postdoc, uh, Evan Howard, have been working on a complementary approach which involves the development of a metabolic index um, which is very much sort of in the same concept of this um, HSI in which you can be um, looking at habitat compression from multiple um, stressor perspectives, including both oxygen and temperature. And so ultimately what we'll be doing is pairing these two approaches, bringing them together in a model, in the model output, and then starting to understand to what extent when we look at ocean space over time, um, what are the what are the stressors that are really driving um, the problem? Is it OA and temperature by itself? Is it is it oxygen by itself? Is it a combination of oxygen and temperature um, and uh, and OA? And I think that the answers to those questions will um, will lead us down paths to consider how to um, uh, progress into the future. So that would be sort of my two cents on that question for the moment. Great, thank you, Martha. Another question here, uh, so this is about community, community engagement. Do you currently have partnerships with education nonprofits or other informal institutions that can provide the bridge between the scientific community and the public? If not, is this an avenue you could use to increase public understanding and support for the issue? So I know the task force was thinking about engaging the community in a need for that um, on this issue and maybe perhaps Steve uh, take on this question about is there a need to increase public awareness and engagement on this. So I'll, I'll answer that question at, at three levels. Um, first is the level at which you do engagement of the task force activities. Um, and clearly there's a desire to do a lot with that. These webinars are just one example. Um, and obviously at the, at the larger level, uh, the governor is having a huge uh, climate summit that's taking place uh, in a few weeks. And there are a lot of uh, essentially parallel events associated with that. Um, so the desire is clearly there. 
Um, then you've got at the uh, at the next level the things that go on with the regulatory. Should we get to the point that we are developing criteria? What's the level of opportunity? That one is very structured. Um, Jonathan can weigh in, but I don't think he even needs to. That's a very structured process with lots of opportunities, workshops and public hearings. Um, so that one's not going to go on without a lot of input. But I think that really the crucial one are the kind of things that Martha's doing right now, the, the model application, because those are really the shorter term uses um, and there's the, really the opportunity. So I'm going to ask Martha to maybe elaborate about how she is bringing, she has steering committees, stakeholder committees associated with the modeling project. Maybe Martha, you could elaborate a little bit on you know, what you're doing presently and what you see as opportunities for people who are not involved to get involved. Sure. So, so to kind of lead off from where Steve's leading off, um, Steve's leading to is that we clearly have an active process for stakeholder engagement in this in this project. Um, you know, we um, are forming these groups around geographic areas um, that really allow for active sort of discussion um, among um, among the locals, basically to understand what does the problem look like when we have a problem. How can we use these modeling tools to to, um, and our science to, and monitoring data to really describe um, better and to communicate to people um, what is, uh, what's the state of that problem, how is it going to be in the future, and, and what can we do about it. So I would say we're, you know, with, but coming back to your question, what you were really, you know, asking about is, you know, are we using sort of a, a strong public education and outreach component you know, in our project right now? And, I'm, and I think that a fair answer to that question would be, well, you know, we're starting down that um, road. You know, typical to scientists, you know, we're really focused uh, right now on getting the science right, getting the, tr you know, getting the tools to the point we can trust them. But clearly, um, and we're coming to this, when we start to put these models, um, the model output and start to use the model or monitoring data to communicate um, to the public what the problem is, um, and, how, and what are we going to do about it? There needs to be a lot of work with experts in and being able to translate um, through data visualization um, the types of graphics that scientists would use into something that's much more palatable to the public. And there's lots of examples of how this is, have been done for, for example, uh, watershed education. Um, you know, our, a good example are our uh, water quality report cards, things like that that can be done. And so what, what I'm really hoping that we can do as we're starting, once we've moved past the point of model development, model validation, and moving into the application phase, that as, we, as we're getting far enough along, we'll really start to do that education and public outreach um, through partnerships um, and to be able to really do a good job bringing that science to the public. So I would welcome suggestions um, that you have or anyone else for that matter and, and who you think the right people uh, would be to engage um, uh, in, to be able to really bring that home. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Martha. So we have about five minutes left. So I'd say we have probably time for one more question. And this one is from Mio Sakashita. What is the most important thing for the state to get to begin to move forward with proposing a new standard? So I know, um, Jonathan, you mentioned a lot of different uh, science needs and actions as potential next steps. But can you prioritize what your high priority need is moving forward for proposing a new standard? Yeah. So. Um there's the the basic threshold question is are there any um, local sources are there sources from um, wastewater or from um, non-point sources like ag um, that are um, tipping the balance because if, if in the end um, local sources aren't um, causing a significant change in impacts from ocean acidification going through a, a multi-year process to develop a standard isn't really going to be much, isn't going to help. It, it might provide information that folks want on how bad the impact is um, compared to a standard, but it won't help solve the problem. We're not likely to take on that level of work if there is no nothing we can do about it. Um, at least not, it won't be as high a priority. 
Okay, thank you. So I would say that that is our final question. I'm going to put, if we didn't get to your questions, I apologize, but I'm gonna put up everyone's email address. So if you wanna reach out to any of the speakers after this, please do so. Uh, Steve, I'll pass it over to you. If you have any closing remarks, I wanted to also thank all of our speakers, all of the task force members, all of the attendees, and also the Ocean Protection Council for funding this effort. So Steve, I'll pass it back to you. Steve, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, same thing that you just said, Haley. Thank you to all the presenters. <laughs> um, and then particularly, thank you to the 100 people who sat through two hours. Um, clearly, this <laughs> topic of interest. Uh, we hope to interact with you all again in the future. And Haley has put up the, uh, the email addresses of all the speakers. Feel free to give them a holler. Great, thank you so much everyone. We'll post this link on the West Coast OAH task force page and I will follow up with an email with all the presentations and a link to the video recording. So thank you and stay tuned for our next webinar coming up in a few months. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.